Listen to Martin, Maria, and Farouk discussing some project work. Then answer questions one to seven. Hi Martin. Hi Maria. How are you getting on with your project? You've got to give the seminar on Friday, haven't you? Hi Farouk. We're getting on fine. It's just so interesting. Do you want to hear about it? Well, I've got ten minutes before my next lecture, so why not? Let's hear it. Great. And it'll help us to sort out who said what, won't it, Martin? That's right. You know what we've been looking at is research done by a number of psychologists from different parts of the world on intelligence quotients. How they've been rising over the last fifty years. Really? Yes. Some psychologists have measured increases in intelligence of up to twenty-five points in one generation. Amazing. What's causing us all to get cleverer? There's a political scientist from New Zealand called James Flynn. Well, he's a pioneer in this field, and he's found that people perform the visuospatial tasks in intelligence tests much better than they did fifty years ago. Partly, he puts this down to people playing with their PCs and watching TV, things like that. What about diet? Does that have anything to do with it? Perhaps. Robert Howard, a Sydney psychologist, thinks that it does. Just as eating better has made children taller, their average intelligence has also risen. He also says that parents are having fewer children, so they're able to pay more attention to them when they're small. It's fairly clear that stimulation in childhood has a positive effect on kids' intelligence. IQ tests have verbal and numerical elements too. Have these also been improving? Yes, but only moderately. It's the visuospatial element which has made the big difference. And Flynn also suggests that modern activities like driving may play a part in this. There's a British researcher, John Rust, who has made the general point that modern life is much more complicated than it was 50 years ago. Our intelligence has had to develop in order to cope with it all. Remember also that far more children have the opportunity to go to school nowadays. Howard thinks that must be a leading factor in improved IQ test performance. Well, yes, that would seem fairly obvious. To come back to John Rust, he suggests that as science and knowledge develop, ideas become more complex. Well, the people who produce these ideas, the Einsteins and Hawkings, are obviously highly intelligent people. But he says ordinary people's intelligence has also had to develop to cope with his new theories. Before they continue their discussion, you have some time to look at questions eight to ten. Now listen to the second part of the discussion and answer questions eight to ten. Are there any limits to intelligence, or will the human race just continue to get cleverer and cleverer? Well, actually, research in some Western industrialized countries, such as Australia, and some European countries, suggests that intelligence rose quite steeply for two or three decades, and then levelled off a few years ago. Some pessimists think that quite soon we may see it beginning to dip. In some countries, students seem to be less motivated than before. In that sense, there may well be a limit to intelligence. On the other hand, this rise in intelligence started to happen some years later in East Asian countries, the so-called Asian tigers, and it still hasn't levelled off. Is higher intelligence what has caused exam results to improve here in Britain? Do you think? Well, that's rather a political question, so it depends who you ask. But you must remember that thirty years ago, only about five percent of school leavers here went on to university. 
But there's been a vast expansion of the university system, and nowadays about 30% of young people get a higher education. So I guess exams must have been getting easier for all those people to get in. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear a speech given by a man called George Dyson about Northfield Sports Complex. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. On behalf of Northfield Sports Complex, I'd like to extend our warmest welcome to you all here this evening. I'm George Dyson, founder of Northfield Sports Complex. I am giving this speech today to celebrate a special occasion. We started the business exactly a decade ago, and today we have developed into a large firm with a sizeable group of members. We've also been nominated the most valuable company by Green Town at the Yearly Business Awards, which will be held next week. As experienced and qualified reporters, you are invited here to experience and witness this historical moment of Northfield Sports Complex together with us. Situated within the campus of Green Town University, Northfield Sports Complex is a modern, refreshing and fully equipped facility for sports of all kinds. As part of its commitment to the local community, Northfield Sports Complex is available not only to school children, but also to local residents. It offers a wide range of facilities, including a 25-metre swimming pool, paved walking and jogging paths, a well-equipped fitness gym, all-weather pitches, indoor courts for table tennis, tennis and other sports, as well as a renowned skating rink. Different age groups can all find the right sports to participate in. That's why local residents enjoy working out here. As a result, natives here are healthier than most of the people within our nation. The whole town is very proud of having nurtured two world champions who were once both trained right here in our skating rink. Thus, it has become the ideal venue to learn to skate and have fun. But what I take pride in most of all is the skating rink that has stirred the interest of boys and girls here in local schools to skate. Since opening, an increasing number of pupils have been paying regular visits to the skating rink. A new yoga classroom with trainers will be open next month for mothers with babies. They can bring their own yoga mat and work out together with their babies. This will be a great way for them to get healthy and meet other mums. There will also be a brand new gym open to the pensioners in the near future. Just this month, a new swimming pool is open to all fitness levels with special offers for those without a job. Our complex is open daily from 8 a.m. to 9 p.m., except on Thanksgiving and Christmas. We intend to extend our business in the coming year. A list of equipment will be put up for sale, ranging from exercising equipment like cardio machines to sports recovery and injury prevention facilities. Within our complex, we try our best to avoid injuries of any kind. We train knowledgeable staff to guide our clients through correct workout regimens. For those who want to further ensure workout safety, they are welcome to apply to be a member of our standing committee. They are responsible for revising the safety guidelines and supervising its enforcement. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Now, I would like to introduce some of our most popular sports facilities here at Northfield Sports Complex. Our 25-metre swimming pool is the centrepiece of the complex, combining modern, bright and airy surroundings with fully up-to-date changing facilities. The pool is excellent for learning how to swim, improving techniques and, of course, competing in school competitions. It is also bookable for private functions, including pool parties, where lifeguards are available. Next, we have the only climbing wall throughout the whole town. Many would see rock climbing as a type of extreme sport, exposing great risk to those who participate. But actually, under proper guidance and with close supervision by the coach here, it is a perfect sport for the youth to increase their flexibility and strengthen their muscles. I have to mention our skating rink once again. As our most popular facility, it has been prominently featured in a TV commercial we've released recently. There is no other skating rink larger than ours within the whole nation. Also, our state-of-the-art gym is an inspiring place to train and keep fit in relaxed and friendly surroundings. The Techno Gym equipment enables our clients to measure their performance. If you book a one-on-one -on -one trainer, he or she might suggest a future training plan and help you train more systematically. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a conversation between an academic advisor and a student asking for information about a particular subject that she wants to study. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Come in and take a seat. Thank you. Now, you've made an appointment to see me with regard to one of the papers you want to enrol next semester. Yes, that's right. It's the Globalisation and Educational Change paper, GEC 692. Ah, well, I know the one you mean but all the code numbers are going to change next semester, so although the course name will stay the same, the code will be ED995. Not that you have to worry about that. But the content will be the same, right? Oh, yes, to a large extent. The objectives are still to provide you with the skills and knowledge for analysing the challenges that globalisation poses for education. Yes, that's what I'm really interested in. The future of education, not where we are now, but where we're heading. Well, you'll most likely enjoy the course because it'll give you the opportunity not just to explore, but also to document the advancement of new educational developments. And there'll be quite a lot of analysis involved. Yes, obviously. But once you've examined how education has been affected by cultural values and socio-economic structures, you'll go on to debate the pros and cons of the restructuring of public education in view of rapid globalisation. I see, but when you say public education, do you mean worldwide? No, no. That would be far too large an undertaking for just one paper you'd probably choose to work with the education system within your own state or country. Sounds interesting, but isn't it a bit restrictive? Not at all. From there, you'd move on to explore the impact of internationalisation 
on curriculum diversity in both developing and developed countries. Have you had a chance to look at the assessment criteria yet? Actually, I have. And it makes me a bit nervous just thinking about it. Why is that? Well, I see that the first assignment starts with an illustrated PowerPoint presentation to the rest of the class. I've never done one before. No need to worry. You can get help with that. Anyway, this presentation isn't graded. It's what we call a formative assessment. The feedback you get will help you to finalise the written review. That's a review of those academic articles in the first part of the reading list, right? Yes, but you only have to choose five of them. That first assignment is worth 30%. And the second assignment? There are two parts to that also, and both are graded. 20 marks will go towards your participation in a seminar, and then there's a 5,000-word essay, which will be graded out of 50. Thanks. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Is there anything else I can help you with? Yes. The reading list is quite long. Where do you think I should start? Well, I'd suggest you leave the articles until the semester is underway, but a good preparation would be to look at some of the major texts. These ones here. In any particular order? You could start with this one by Tower, here at the bottom of the page. Sorry, who? Tower. T-O-W-E-R. 2007. Comparative Education. That should give you a good basis. Then move on to Elliot. Educational Issues of the New Millennium. But be sure to get the 2008 edition, not the original 1998 edition because so much has changed since 1998. The new edition has extensive revisions and a lot of new material. OK, so that's Tower first, then Elliot. I think I could handle a couple more over the summer break. Well, in that case, look for Brown's Education and Globalisation, published in 2009. Actually, there are quite a few books by Brown, but I'd start with that one and leave his others till much later. And I'd also really recommend this one here, Globalisation and Knowledge Policy by York, published quite recently, in fact, 2010. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You will hear part of a lecture on cities of the future. You now have 30 seconds to read questions 31 to 37. OK, we've been looking at how societies will develop in the future and at the increase in the size of cities. So I want to talk to you today about the key considerations in these cities of the future. There are three key elements I want to look at, and these are the new features they will have, issues of size, and the main problems to be considered.
First of all, individual transportation will be a big factor in these new megacities as public transport becomes unmanageable. There'll be a huge rise in the use of segways, which are personal transporters, like motorized scooters. As a result, and partly also to reduce pollution, roads will be altered so that they are narrower and will take up less of a city's space than they do currently. Naturally, this is a major change to the infrastructure, and something that may hinder it is the huge amount of investment it will require. The next thing is, what is going to happen to the commercial areas? We do not want these to become even larger concrete jungles than they are at present, so we have to look at design. And current designs for city development include building gardens on the roofs of these buildings to make a more pleasant environment for workers. And you may think that these areas will expand to cope with increased commercial activity. In fact, the prediction is that they will cover one-fifth of the area that they do at present as we build upwards. The exception to this is shopping centres, which we predict will expand with more and more temperature-controlled malls. What may cause difficulties is that the superstores will be confined to the outer edges of the city as they will be too big to fit into the new malls. Then, of course, there are the residential areas, and these will undergo their own changes. One particular development will be houses which are built from glass, as innovations in this material allow it to provide light without causing problems with temperature inside a building. The residential areas will not be allowed to expand without limit, as happens in some areas at present, and their size will be restricted to a population of 15,000. One issue which has yet to be resolved, and I'm not sure it ever will be, is how we manage to house older residents. They will be increasing in numbers as time goes on. Finally, how will these cities live? We know we have limited energy sources, so what will we do? Well, something currently in development, which will be a feature, is that waste is going to become an energy source. For example, to provide gas in homes. Also, as new technology and systems are developed, we will find that energy plants will become smaller. Another energy source we could use, but one which raises issues of having enough space and too much noise, is wind farms. Because of the problems, I'm not convinced these will be the grand solution to our energy problems that we thought they were going to be. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 38 to 40. Now, moving on to looking at the social aspect of cities, we need to look at housing and how people will live. Cities currently have flats in the centre, populated by single people and wealthier residents, and families tend to move to the outskirts. In the future, the centre of cities will see a dramatic change. We will see many more examples of cooperative buildings. This is where people join together to form a company that owns the building they live in. And despite continuing shortages, there will also be a rise in the provision of retirement homes in city centres so that the elderly can have easy access to hospitals and shops. Recently, we have seen a levelling off in the growth of private housing, and I think that will not change. But we are likely to see more social housing, as far fewer people will be able to afford to own their own homes. OK, now, if...